Welcome to here on Radio Horror uh, tonight, where we cover not just horror topics sometimes, but we also talk about the dead and who have passed away, but we also talk about science fiction and fantasy. And being a documentary uh, filmmaker myself, which is something I can actually put on my resume, uh, <laughs> if you uh, look up a project I'm working on coming up, it's up called Untold Tales, Untold Legends of Comic Books. Uh, we have on the show with us uh, the director of the Dave Stevens Drawn to Perfection documentary, which just got put on Blu-ray if you were on the Kickstarter behind it and might be coming out in some other way. Because so people have been asking me, how do I find that? And I'm like, I don't know. Call the Kickstarter guy. Uh, email Kevin on Kickstarter. He'll tell you because I don't want to speak if it's coming someplace I'm not aware of. Thank you for coming on the show with us, Kevin. Uh, thanks for having me, Chris. Uh, so where can people find this documentary now that it is coming? Um, it's, uh, on all most streaming platforms. You can find it on iTunes, uh, uh, Amazon prime, uh, uh, Google play, uh, YouTube. And it's also on, I just found this out a number of like library associated, uh, streaming services, uh, canopy and hoopla. Okay. That's good. Um, yeah, by the way, uh, everybody download the hoopla app. It's a library app that ties into most national, sorry, most national libraries through the United States. Just gonna stick to the United States. Um, and if you can't afford some of the graphic novels that are coming out, like they're big in DC, less in the Marvel for some reason. This is prior to the separation of church and state with uh, Diamond. Um, but uh, if you're big in DC comics and independent books like Dark Horse and IDW, this app has those books for free for two to three weeks. You can read them. So if you don't want to purchase them or you can't afford to, which the comic book industry understands, not everyone can afford comic books, go to that app and download it or read it, or listen to the audiobook. There is an amazing audiobook by George Newbern about Superman. I absolutely love So it's Superman talking about Superman, the voice of Superman from Justice League. Um, he also does a really good one about Reagans at the movies, talking about the Reagans uh, during the White House, in the White House, uh, what movies they watched. It's a great audiobook. Uh, but good to know that Dave Stevens' uh, documentary is on there, too. Um, when I saw the cover to it, I was just, like, baffled about, like, the Betty Page thing, and then I had to remember... But like, oh, that's right. Jennifer Connelly's character from the movie is kind of like based on like Betty Page's look, as is that character in the comic book. Now, the thing with Dave is I, I didn't know squat about him other than he was the creator of The Rocketeer. And I never pursued it just because it didn't really occur to me and what else he had ever done until I heard about this documentary and I started looking into it more and then watched it and realized, good God, this man loved to draw Betty Page looking style women more often than anything else, probably on par with like people like uh, like Frank Frazetta, who also had a big thing about drawing fantasy barbarian style women, or Tim Vigil, who drew just, let's just say, it, pornographic style women. Uh, <laughs> whereas Dave, though, was a lot more conservative with his art, but it was definitely artistic nude, I guess, if you want that's the, the, the term for it. I call it like Playboy to be artistic nudity. Um, whereas like, you know, Tim Vigil was more like the penthouse <laughs> version of artistic dudes. Um, and why Dave Stevens? Well, uh, Dave Stevens uh, and I were friends. Uh, actually, oh. Tim Vigil also. Tim Vigil is one of my oldest friends as well. But uh, 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 Dave Stevens was a, a friend of mine, uh, and and I got to know him. Unfortunately, I wish I'd known him longer. I got to know him about the last uh, eight or nine years of his life. And uh, at the time uh, when he became sick, he he hid it from a lot of people, so I actually didn't know until uh, he'd been into the in, uh, into the um, you know the, uh, the disease for a bit that that uh, uh, that he was actually sick. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, he a lot of us uh, other people who became friends with him at the same time weren't aware because he was so he was a very private person. So that was something that like he you know for a number of reasons I think you know because of work he didn't want people to like not give him work he you know it, and also because he had this sort of like old worldly gentlemanly uh sort of sensibility of, from the, of the 1930s which was the time period he loved i think that influenced a lot of like how he conducted himself you know in life and so he wasn't the type of person to talk about money or 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 health stuff you know so i um, i get that um when i'm sick or hurt it takes a little while for me to finally admit i need help um it's just the way i am um uh, I don't know, I'm not going to get in my deep psychological background, but you know what I mean? I, I get that. I, I totally understand that. Um, to the point that I've gotten in trouble at work, my boss is like, why didn't you ask for help? I'm like, I don't know. 
I think the bigger question is why did we do a documentary? And that's just, and I think that COVID is probably the the culprit for that. We were sitting around with nothing to do, and that, and so uh, the editor Rob Chatlin, he was the one he had edited a uh, um, a documentary about Scotch whiskey that was supposed to debut in April 2020 in Scotland, which of course it did not. Who's and so he was sort of sitting around. Well, well, and who is that? Just real quick, who is that for the? Oh, Rob Chatlin. Rob Rob Chatlin is the uh, is the uh, other producer. You know, I'm the I'm the director uh, producer. The other producer who is the editor of the film, Rob Chatlin, a uh, longtime uh, editor at uh, FX Networks. Uh, he's a promo editor, but he ju- he had just edited a documentary, a uh, feature length documentary about about Scotch whiskey, which we're all big enthusiasts of, of centered around um, Jim McEwen and uh, Brooke Lottie. And so he was sort of looking for something else to do. This was a new experience for him, doing a narrative, doing a well, doing a feature length uh, uh, as opposed to a, a promo. And um, you know, so we were sitting around, and 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 it was me and him and the our executive producer, uh, 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 Robert Wyndham, uh, you know, just trying to decide what to do. We're sitting in Robert uh, Rob Chatlin's backyard, like you know, like spread out the corners, you know, because it's COVID, and we're like at corners of the yard yelling at each other. And uh, and Rob Chatlin said, "Hey, what, what about another documentary? I love doing documentary. What, do, what about we do one, the three of us, as opposed to the team he'd done the other one with?" And uh, that's basically how it started. We we had nothing to do, and uh, we, we we turned to him and asked him, "Hey, what 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 should we be about?" And, and Rob Chatlin, knowing that both uh, Robert Wyndham was a huge fan of Dave Stevens, and he knowing that I knew Dave and was friends with the family, and I, I and me along with my friend Dave Mandel, who's a very well-known collector and also a writer producer. He, uh, you know, we 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 had helped manage their estate after uh, Dave passed away. Uh, you know, he that's where the idea came from, and we sort of looked at each other and we're like, yeah, you know, well, well, let's think about this and figure out whether we can make this work. Uh, it was a new experience for two of us. Uh, uh, Rob Chatlin had edited uh, what was called "The Water of Life," is the name of that documentary. Um, he'd edited it, but hadn't been there for the whole process. Um, he'd kind of been brought in later on. So this is our opportunity to to learn what it was to make a feature film from like, really from like square one, which a square one took a long time because I think we had, Bleeding Cool did a nice announcement for us, announcing the project in November of 2020. But then you couldn't interview anybody or do anything until mm-hmm. uh, we shot our first interview in April of 2021. And so there was many months of just beating the bushes looking for photos, asking people for any old footage, you know, stories, artwork, anything that hadn't been seen before, um, which was actually kind of tough. Is If you've seen any pictures of Dave, D- you know, Dave drew, drew himself as a rocketeer. Um, if you've seen any any pictures of that, you, you'll know that um, Dave was a, a, a good looking guy who uh, put some time into his, his appearance. So given that you'd think he would run into a video camera once in a while, but it was very difficult to find uh, footage uh, particularly uh uh you know, like closer to when he passed away because he was sensitive about his appearance and and uh, i myself don't have a, a photo together because when he was was ill he he um you know everyone who was friends with him would, would you know realize well he didn't want to be be on camera so um you know maybe I, I my dream is that during this project that somewhere out there there's a someone took a candid photo of us at like san diego comic-con where i happen to be standing by the booth you know, while, while they're taking a picture of Dave, that's sort of like the, uh, I'll, I'll put that as like the secret reason why I did this in the first place to try and see if someone would, uh, would come that would come out of the woodwork, you know, the, um, the, the documentary opened my eyes up to like what he loved to draw. And I've always felt as though in today's culture, especially in the last, let's just go back three years. Um, we could be on tangents about timelines and stuff forever. Uh, three years, cancel culture has really ruined a lot of things that don't necessarily need to be picked apart and destroyed just because it's not your thing. Um, and for the things that it does need to be, then that's fine. I'm probably in agreement with you based on my own feelings about certain prejudices and blah, 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 blah. But things like Dave Stevens' artwork, Tim Vigil's, Frank Rosetta's, uh, we had Frank Rosetta's uh, granddaughter on the show, Sarah, and I brought this question up to her, like, wait, like, how do you feel like about the backlash with, like, images, like, we're seeing and people being like, that's not okay anymore, you can't draw people like that, you can't portray women this way, and I'm like, what, as, like, fierce, awesome-looking warriors and badass, and they're not necessarily, like, Victoria's Secret supermodels, they cut, they're curvy and a little chubby, and they look like real people, that's not okay, what? 
and then Dave Stevens with all of his artwork, like looking like Betty Page, you know, and and that was like the big bulk of looking like his work in the documentary before he went anywhere mainstream. Sometimes was drawing like pinup girls, half undressed, half unclothed, but never derogatory in any way, you know, or never pornographic in any way. Again, leave that to other people who want to draw that sort of thing. Um, and I'm a big fan of Tim Vigil, by the way. He's done three covers for me on books of mine, and which is like a big deal because he doesn't lend his artwork out or work outside of his own realm. But I just got hooked up with him because of COVID. I did a Kickstarter and someone introduced me to Tim Vigil. I'm like, Tim, this is Chris, and he wants to do this gender swap story of Dracula. No, Tim's great. Uh, uh, he, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of his from when I was in college. So, um, we, um, but back uh, to the we, other uh, question, we, though, like, how do you feel about like Dave Stevens' artwork today? Uh, like, people's reaction to it, seeing it sometimes. Well, I mean, I mean, you make a good point that Dave, Dave, Dave tried to walk this very fine line of, of being both, you know, you know, drawing beautiful women but not objectifying and being respectful, tr trying to capture some part of this character. You know, mm -hmm. that you're, you know, you got to usually they're dressed in costume or something, a character and, 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 and something in the face and the eyes. I mean, he always started with the eyes. That was his whole thing. If the eyes weren't right and the piece wouldn't leave the drawing table. He always start there. Um, and so to me, that's the difference, you know what I mean? Like, I think that that's what he was going for. I think he was going for something a little more subtle, a little more nuanced, you know, than, than, than just trying to do the, the sex sells thing. Certainly uh, he would say, he would tell you this himself, you know, uh, that this is a journey you know he he had to find his way and and he he you know he did look back on things and go oh i probably should have done that one you know what i mean oh that was a little bit across the line but i think as an artist you have you don't know where the lines are until you've tried it out and figured it out you know and 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 cross them and then figure out where you want to set that that balance and i think dave dave's work is very balanced uh in addition to being beautiful just in terms of his inking ability and just the lush delicate um, you know, I mean, I don't say it as well as the people in the documentary do. I mean, if you listen to some of the artists talk about it with that reverence, it's a different, it's a totally different thing because they're, they're seeing it different. They're seeing it as, as, as people who are also trying to pursue their own version of that, of that philosophy. They have their own aesthetics. And so I think we're respected by a lot of uh, his peers because uh, the funny, the one thing I learned about Dave, like doing the documentary, interviewing so many of his friends and colleagues and family is that. He seemed to be a guy trying to live his entire life by this sort of artistic aesthetic. Like um, one of the things that didn't make it into the documentary was one of our, one of our interviewees told us about going to visit him in his studio. I think it was one of the ladies um, going to visit him, Dave's, Dave's studio and just seeing this sort of messy studio. But that they sort of looked around, they started to realize that like, you know, a leather jacket draped like seemingly haphazardly on a chair you know, it was, was kind of draped just perfectly, you know, it was, it was almost like a stage, you know, mm -hmm. and I think he was almost living as if, you know, someone's watching this as a TV show or a piece of entertainment or something, you know what I mean? Uh, 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 and, and, and just cognizant of how, how, how things appeared as he just went through life, even when no one was around, you know, so, um, and I think that's one of the things that, that, that other artists uh, sort of, you know, um, keyed in on, you know, something that I didn't really think about uh, before when we were, we were friends, you know, we were friends, fan, I was a fan first, you know, I met him actually in San Diego, 1992, when I moved out to LA, but I, we didn't become friends until 98, 99. I mean, you know, like I, start, I started to, uh, by, by commissioning to do some pieces, another collector introduced us and then we just became friends. I would, I was trying to take drawing classes myself at night for fun and uh he lived nearby where i was going so you know he, i would call him up afterwards you know what i mean he he had odd hours like i did and we'd meet some oh god he loved these old crappy diners like in you know north hollywood and burbank and they were open late and they've been there forever he, he's very much into the sort of old retro things you know but like they had to be like genuine you know they had to be um of the time and uh, unfortunately that food was usually pretty terrible at these places so you know but he, he he loved you know sitting there and being there i imagine he seeing it from a far away perspective of you know dave stevens you know through the window from outside you know what i mean having his bowl of chili or whatever it was he was eating you know so 
Have you, had, <clears throat> excuse me, have you ever worked on a documentary before prior to this? No, no. Uh, the only. You owned a comic book store, you said. Yes, yes. When I was in high school, I worked at a comic book store in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania called uh, Beachhead Comics, run by a great guy, Jeff Rabkin, who unfortunately is not with us anymore. Although someone took up the mantle, I believe the store, there was a store, the store is, the store with a name is still, still in Allentown, but at a different location, a block due way. Um, and um, where am I going with the, with, uh, you know, so I had written some comic book stories uh, prior to the documentary. I'd written one feature, um, a movie called 10 Minutes Gone which was a like s small crime thriller uh, that starred uh, uh, Bruce Willis and Michael Chiklis. And that had come out at the end of 2019 or fall of 2019. So again, I was in a little kind of limbo uh, when the pandemic hit, sort of sitting around, not sure what to do next. And uh, uh, it's fortunate that uh, Rob Chatlin came up with this idea so, uh, so that Robert Wyndham and I could <laughs> something to do. And Robert Wyndham had just finished shooting a, a feature himself. He'd written a rom-com. Uh, and it also just barely got in under the COVID wire. I think they were just just finishing up when everything got locked down. But then he was just they were just stuck waiting around trying to figure out well how long till we can release something, you know. So, but at least they had post production to keep them busy. Who were you not able to get that you really wanted for this documentary? Is there somebody that is like a piece missing that you were like they probably had a big story? They might have passed away, or and if I passed away, I mean like recently during your time doing the interviews not passed away like 10 years ago like Betty Page passed away what 2008 or something um, Betty Page passed away in December of 08 Dave passed away in March of 08 so it's about six months apart uh, of okay. each other and, um, um, did, did her documentary uh whatever it was called I, I remember it I, I think I own it I just not watched it does her documentary talk about Dave there were there he's I think yeah he's 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 uh represented in it I don't think he's it, there's some there's some uh uh archival footage of him in there okay uh, uh she's on she's in it like as an old lady too well her voice her voice she's her very voices. protective also about her uh image she didn't like she didn't want to be pho photographed when she was in her 70s and and later i'm having a terrible time remembering the name of the documentary i know mark bad uh, something unchained like oh god I can't remember. Well, I'm just yeah. gonna look it up because like <laughs> otherwise i'm gonna i'm gonna feel bad and someone's gonna, gonna yell at me um but uh, let's see, Betty Page. Right, let's see. Well, there were two of them. Uh, oh, good lord! Uh, there was two of them. Uh, there was an earlier one that was more of a, a, a like a dramatization. Ah, yeah, yes. yeah, I saw that movie. Yeah, Betty, 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 Betty Page, Page reveals all. Betty Page reveals all, which was directed by Mike Mark Mark Mori, who helped okay. us with this doc too. So yeah, that um, makes sense. But, yeah. But but he worked on that. It was that David already passed away? I think he had some footage and some recordings from 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 Betty. Um, and uh, but but they they you know Mark had come to to us or to 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 me to you know like when, when looking for stuff from the Dave Stevens estate and and we we gave them some art and stuff to use you know so oh so uh, there's an estate of Dave's like artwork. Who's the uh, the state holder? Uh, it, his sister uh, Jennifer Balkum is the is, is okay. Yeah, she's in the documentary. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And before that, it was it was it was his Dave's mom, uh, Carolyn, right. Carolyn Stevens, um, uh, for for a few years, and she passed away, and then uh, it moved on to Jennifer. Does she currently own the rights to the Rocketeer? Yes, uh, they still have all Dave's IP. It's 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 under current license for comic books to um, which is fine. IDW Publishing to IDW. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then of course that. the movie the movie rights are still with with Disney for That's so weird considering That's that weird. they flopped and they never did anything with it afterwards and it's not like that thing has ever gotten a proper Blu-ray release for collectors. I mean, being on Disney Plus right now, it's it will never will <laughs> unless they yeah, like no, it's a, unless it's unless like something happens and like oh Marvel's gonna publish now oh the Rocketeers uh, fought with Captain America World War Two. <laughs> well, you know, we always talked about. I mean, Dave had pitched to Superman like Golden Age Superman. Rocketeer uh, crossover to DC in the late nineties. Uh, was that an actual script written that they could pull out of the archives and be like, "Guess what we're doing?" Well, they they didn't approve it, but the estate has you know like his progress, and it was you know like a couple drafts of three issues, so a couple drafts of each, and so it's something they could go like to the estate and say, "Hey, we want to publish that." You know? Oh, we've tried. We've tried a number of times. We've oh. uh, gone to IDW. Numerous editors have made the attempt, and it's just a tough thing to do. Because DC has their own sort of issues with Superman and and their creators, so uh, it's a big, it's a little bit of a mess right now. Until oh, still, I thought that 
don't get resolved. It is resolved, but but it made, it makes it more complicated to try and do something now. Oh, with, okay. Like, that era Superman. So uh, anyway. oh, it's that era of Superman. Okay, got it. No, I understand what you're saying now. Um, there's um, that off the top of my head. Um, there there are so many un, un unmade projects that um would work so well for a comic book. And when I hear something like that, I'm reminded of like. Just before Dark Horse lost the Alien license, they put out the Alien Unmade script as a comic book and the Alien Three as a comic book. Yeah, yeah, I read it. I read that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it got into my head going, you know, someone should do Warner Brothers. Somebody should make the Unmade Gremlin script as a comic book. The one where Gizmo turns into Spike and then it's much more violent. The mom is killed. The dog is killed. You know, there's a lot of violence. Oh no, I didn't know about this. I was yeah. Worried. There's a lot of violence in it, and they had to tone <laughs> it down. And um, they couldn't have mom die. They couldn't have the dog die. You know, things like that which would not have gotten them very well. Uh, and Gremlins probably wouldn't be the phenomenon it is. Maybe it would be. Who knows? But there's also, like, the Beetlejuice script. Like, there's an original Beetlejuice script before they made all the changes that were what we know to be Beetlejuice today. Where, again, he's much more demonic. He's much more sexually driven. Things like that. Things that just wouldn't work in that kind of movie that Tim Burton wanted to do. I'm like, then make that into a comic book. Because fans would love to see that. Um, the comics that, definitely offer a you know offer an avenue to do a lot of things that you know for and also you know you, there's no there's no budget constraints in a comic book you right. just have you have an artist who can draw draw what yeah you want. just pay the artist and then you know with, and then just rewrite the script and do a comic book format um there this uh so you got the documentary done um and it's funny it just came out like right after the uh, the mcnola documentary so it was like back-to-back -back information about people i had no clue about like i knew a lot more about mcnola having met him several times at cons and been to panels of his but dave was just a complete blank for me and i got it in the mail and like after a week later when i got it i just i finally stuck it in there and then i was just like oh i gotta watch this again but i'm, I'm gonna watch it with somebody else i know who's never seen this and doesn't know anything about him um it's just a really well captivating story uh, what are you going to do next as a like a follow-up is there somebody else that you ever wanted to do a documentary about like this well we're sort of during research one of the things we discovered while while doing the documentary um uh uh what uh, was just that like all the people that have the people who were in the documentary could anchor their own documentary you know mm. i mean bill stout could, could have his own thing uh, jim silk has a long story career you know in, in old hollywood you know he's a guy who you know, retired as a screenwriter and, and became an illustrator at age 60, you know what I mean? As inspired by Dave Stevens. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of people there that are, you know, Danny Bilson, his partner, unfortunately passed away. Paul DeMeo passed away in 2018 of cancer. But like, you know, the team of Bilson and DeMeo were like all the rage in, in TV with the original, the first Flash series and uh, all the stuff they were doing, Viper and, and, and um, Human Target back in the early 90s. There's a lot of people, you know, so we're sort of in the research stage of like, what do you have? Um, which this reminds me also. You'd mentioned before, like, who did we not get that we wanted? You know, there were people who passed away that I, I I thought to myself a lot of times while making this. God, if I'd just done this sooner, Harlan Ellison would still be here. I could interview him. You know, Bernie Wrightson. They were he and Dave were great friends. We were lucky to have the the footage from um, outtake footage from the uh, uh, Frazetta documentary. That that's yeah, what that's from, I love know, that from Frazetta documentary. Lance Lespina was kind enough to, to help us out there. It's also uh, out of print and hard to find. Uh, sometimes. Right, right, right. I don't right. think it's streaming him, either. I think he should reissue that, remaster mm, that thing because it's not streaming. No, no, no. I, I, in fact, it was tough for me to find it to do research. We we watched a lot of documentaries, particularly about artists, to do research, and I actually had, had to dig my old copy. I realized I I had ordered a Blu-ray of that or a Blu-ray, a DVD of that mm. from like you know out of diamond previews like you know like a decade two decades ago whatever I, it was i yeah. found it at a, a thrift store so i was just like ah steal buy it's not a thrift store it was a like a used uh, whatever store they had a bunch of dvds tons of dvds i was like i didn't know there was a documentary about frank Brazil. i know frank Brazil's artwork but i don't know anything about the guy i know all i know his artwork very well but i don't know anything about the guy whatsoever so that was big eye-opening you know bodybuilder and like you know this 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 just this this way he was or whatever when he was painting women and stuff like that and just how like you know just it's it, it just a lot of eye-opening stuff whatever which i then talked about when i had sarah on his granddaughter um we are unfortunately at a bit of time almost uh, but uh hey what again why don't you give out the information for social media where people can find the the, the documentary about dave Kelvin? 
Well, I mean, it, uh, Samuel Goldwyn was is our distributor, and there's a, there's a, a website link I can give you for that that I probably can't rattle off the top of my head. But you know, they've got a page that page lists all the streaming uh, links, okay. so you would have uh, iTunes, uh, um, uh, Amazon, uh, Google Play, uh, YouTube, and Vudu are the ones that are definitely on there. And then, like I said, Canopy and Hoopla were added. Uh, you know, that those are recent additions, that, and they're, they're not on there. Um, okay. But um, we don't have a website or, or, or a social media page, you know, specifically specifically for the doc. Unfortunately, like the three of us all have full time jobs, so gotcha. this is all done with. Uh, this is all done, you know, COVID. Everyone's working at home, so there's a lot of. Uh, hopefully, none of my our bosses are watching this or hearing this. You know, uh, there there's a lot of days where I, we were probably working on the doc more than we were working on our actual jobs. So. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on the show to talk about this uh, amazing documentary you guys did. No, thanks for having thanks for having me on, man.